Good morning, everyone. <laughs> a very warm welcome to St. James Church, uh, to those of you here in the building and also to those who are joining us online. Um, I hope you're feeling awake. Hopefully you've had a coffee before you came to church, so you're ready to enter into worship. There is a reason why we were playing that song by the Boo Radleys, uh, because we're going to be looking at the letter to the church in Sardis in Revelation. And the trouble with the church in Sardis was that they had fallen asleep. So Jesus says to the church, wake up. So I hope you are awake, not just in the physical sense, but also in the spiritual sense. However, uh, I'm sure no one ever falls asleep in church, apart from Daniel. Well, uh, I could mention another person, but I won't embarrass them. <laughs> uh, but uh, I wonder if you've ever had an experience like this. Let's, uh, let's watch our next little video. Thank you, Matthew. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our friend We bow down and worship Him now How great how awesome is he, together we sing, everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with His glory. When stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the world is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He. Together we sing, everyone sing. Lord, I am redeemed 
by your spirit I am free and I will fall at your feet I will fall at your feet and I will worship you here freely you gave it all for us surrendered your life upon that cross great is the love poured out for all this is our God lifted on high from death to life forever our God is glorified servant and king rescued the world this is our again, that you will reign in your church, that we will uh, lift you as Lord and King and Saviour. And so, Lord, we just thank you for being with us, and we ask your blessing to be with us in our worship. And, Lord, we just want to pray for our young people as they prepare to go to their groups now, and for their leaders. Bless them and inspire them as they study your word together. And, Lord, just raise up a new generation of, of young Christians who love you and who are not ashamed of you or the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we wish our young people uh, a great time as they go to the parish centre. Uh, don't forget to take your coats. I think you might need it today. And uh, as they go out to the parish centre, uh, we're going to have our Bible reading. And our Bible reading is from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. If you want to follow this in the Pew Bibles, you'll find it on page 1,200.
and 35. To the church in Sardis. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you do have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can I suggest you might want to keep that passage open in front of you as Nina comes and shares with us. Good morning, everyone. Well done for braving the rain. Slightly concerned about the video earlier on, so if I suddenly see you all standing on your, on your heads, then I know that it's not, it's not quite going my way. Um, so wake up. Just wonder what comes to your mind with that word. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, there were a couple of images that uh, I was thinking <clears throat> as, as I was sort of think of, thinking of, of those two words. And I was reminded of a time when our son Daniel was young. If I can have the second slide, please. Don't know whether you are a morning person, whether you like sort of getting up early. I have never been a morning person. Uh, that's always a struggle, but, but he was. And I remember he would march into our room in the morning and with a full of excitement, it's morning! <laughs> and I'm going to try to put the cover over myself. I'm thinking, no, it's not. Go back to bed. And so often, I'm sort of feeling a bit guilty of dampening his excitement, thinking, come on, it's a new day. And although it can be exhausting, I think there's also something quite enviable of a young child who is just so excited. Every day is new and exciting and, and full of opportunities, something to discover and be part of, and, and being fully present in the moment. I think that's something quite um, refreshing. And Jesus often commends children as being the ones to whom the kingdom of of God belongs to is calling us to be like children. I think that's one aspect of it. If I can have the, um, the, the second, the, the um, next slide. On the other hand, from the other perspective of being awake, as I'm not a morning person, I don't that often get to go out really, really early and see the sunrise, but just occasionally it happens that I am out really early, and I'm always struck by the beauty of that just seeing the, the new day emerging. And there is that stillness and yet anticipation of what's to come. And there's something like your, your alertness, attentiveness is awakened in the beauty of city slowly waking up or, or countryside, it's just a light rising. And so I'm, I, when, when, when I'm thinking of that word wake up, it brings to mind to me both being active and excited, ready to go, but also being attentive. It's not just full on action, but being awake to what is surrounding us, being present in the moment. And that's one, broadly speaking, what we are looking at this morning in light of our passage, being wakeful in our relationship with Jesus. What does that look like? What might get on the way? Church of Sardis is called to wake up, and we'll be asking two specific questions. What do they need to wake up from, or to? And what follows from this waking up? What does it mean? Um, we are, in, in 
this series of Revelation looking at the seven churches in Asia Minor. And, and we've heard over the last few weeks each church giving these encouragements and challenges from Jesus, mostly either churches being under persecution or compromise. And I think we can already see from our reading that Sardis is more on the compromised side, or even worse, this total complacency. And we've also been talking about this positive sandwich, that often they get an encouragement first, then there's the um, challenge, and that follows with another encouragement. However, Sardis is not having any of it. There's no positive sandwich in sight. It's straight to the challenge. Wake up. So what do they need to wake up to? Preceding that word is that you have, if we see in verse 1, you, um, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. They are strong words, some serious misconception of what their appearance is to what Jesus actually knows to be true about them. That plant that Simon mentioned earlier on, or sometimes we can see that in trees, a tree might look very healthy from outside, but it takes a tree surgeon to see that actually it's rotten inside. There's a real safety hazard. It could come down any time because the strength has gone. Um, there's one slide about just giving some ruins of Sardis in there, slide five. Sardis itself, just to say a, a couple of words about the Sardis itself at this time, it was an affluent city located along important trade routes. The city was in two parts. Um, there's a lower city along a fertile valley, um, adding a river adding to this wealth, and there was an upper city on the summit of a mountain ridge, a location which was believed to be pretty much invadable, invincible. The people of Sardis um, were quite content that they could not be attacked. They would remain secure because of where, where they stood, because of their location. They had a reputation of being proud of their status and security and their history. But however, they had been caught unawares on a couple of occasions. About 600 um, BC, Cyrus's Persian army found a secret entry at night and entered while they were asleep. Same thing happened about 300 years later by another king who had learned about Cyrus's victory. No one expected this to be possible, and yet it was. They did not stand as strong as they thought. So when Jesus continues in verse 3, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. The people of Sardis would relate to that concept from their own history. Like a thief of the night is also a commonly used by Jesus in the Gospels and by Paul and Peter in letters describing Jesus' second coming, that sense that we do not know the timing but we are to be ready so that it won't take us by surprise. And our text is not necessarily directly referring to the second coming, it's what Sardis is experiencing now, but it is alluding to that ultimate return of Jesus also. So Jesus is drawing a parallel to the state of Christians in Sardis. They are asleep. Reputation of being alive, perhaps in their own minds, still content that they have a vibrant fellowship, lots going on. But Jesus makes it clear that this is not the case and transpires that they are relying on their past reputation more than actively living their faith in the, in the now. Well, I think this continues to be a challenge to the church that we find ourselves today as a whole. You know, we might be looking at the decline in numbers or financial challenges or Christianity not having that given presence in the public sphere uh, being perhaps becoming more on the fringes. And it can be tempted to become a bit inward looking or focus on what was in the past, reminiscing, reminiscing on, the, on the good old days when things were this what they, or that way, church was full, respected by all, and, and almost living in the glory of the past. Or even very recently, I caught myself 
it, we don't have to kind of go that far in history sometimes looking at what's known. We, I was thinking of all the good old lockdown days <laughs> when everything was calm and I knew exactly what I can and can't do. How quickly we go into the safety of what we know rather than looking towards what perhaps we don't know so well yet. It's good to look back, to be encouraged by um, how God has led us and being faithful to us. The Bible commends this. But I think this reliance on past or keeping the status quo comes at a cost. It can blind and deafen us to be alert to what God is doing now, what he's calling us towards, where he's truly found today. Despite any challenge that we face, Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. He has promised that he will be with us to the end of days. He's real and he's here as he always was. I've got a slide in there on the path if we show that. I think it's in the light of this passage, it's good for us to ask that question as well. Are there ways that we might be proud? Or are there ways that we might be riding on past reputation and expecting that to carry us on? Ticking along rather than earnestly seeking God in the here and now, in this season, and being open where he might lead us and show us in the new path, perhaps not um, treaded on. You can see the path there, you can see a little bit of it where it's going, but then it turns the corner, and we simply don't know what's behind that corner. And yet, he's the one who's in charge. Are we listening, are we awake to where he's calling us now? So how is Jesus asking the church of Sardis to respond? What follows? from being awakened. If you look at the verse two, wake up, strengthen what remains. I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Strengthen what remains, there's a glimmer of hope. The faith is not all gone. There are still a remnant left. Jesus will not give up on us, even if we are not giving him an attention for a long time, if we then do turn to him and honestly, honestly seek for his strength and for his empowering, he will meet us every day without fault. He has promised to do that. And to me, there is an encouragement that God can, God can cope with weaknesses, even doubts and questions, that's okay. Weaknesses are even commendable at times because it can, re we, it can lead us into greater dependence and humbleness before God. He can take what remains and build on that. I think the key is at that point, we are still engaging with him. We are still calling out to him. And it's, but it's the half-heartedness and self-sufficiency that God has an issue with, because that closes openness to him. We push him away, we won't engage. And that does have the real danger of leading to death in terms of faith. The phrase deeds not complete can be a bit of putting, how can anyone live up to that? Are we just all doomed because we can't be perfect? But it doesn't really refer to perfection in terms of what we do or what we achieve but where our heart is, that really, really matters. Out of the where our heart is flows everything else. Got a slide in there with a proverb, Proverb 4, 23, that says, above all, guard your heart, for it, it is the wellspring of life. The message of the Bible throughout is a call for this wholehearted commitment to God with our whole being. Tom Wright puts it like this, it's all or nothing, either Jesus really is the Lord, rightly asking for our absolute allegiance, or he's a sham and should be rejected outright. It simply won't do to bumble on, looking busy 
but achieving little or nothing. Reputation in itself is not enough. I came across a talk by Simon Gillibon, who you may have heard of. He's a Christian author, missionary, um, speaker, leader. He lived in Burundi for many years and risking his life most days in a very volatile and um, unstable country, witnessed real extreme poverty and need, but was also seeing God uh, move in miracles and protection in, in so many ways. And he, he recently moved back to the UK, and he said that his, one of his biggest fears was that um, the convenience of life would somehow dampen um, his faith, would affect him negatively. Perhaps he wouldn't need God quite in the same way. And he was um, telling about an Iranian Christian who had come from a danger and persecution <clears throat> in Iran, where Christians are seriously persecuted, but church is also amazingly growing. She came to a comfort and safety in America. And after a while, she was almost longing, part of her was almost longing to go back because she felt that she was lulled into sleep. She felt the Christians were lulled <clears throat> into a sleep in the, in the culture that they were in. And she described it quite harrowingly in her words as like a sort of satanic lullaby of the West. And Simon Gillibald reflects on this in light of Matthew 5, um, 13 to 16, where Jesus is calling us to be salt and light in the world. And stopping with that salt and light for a bit, the salt has so many qualities. It gives taste, <clears throat> it's preservative, it um, makes us thirsty. So being a preservative, being salt, we have a role to prevent our society where it might be rotting or going off, if you like, but also preserving what is good. And being thirsty, there is something about um, lifestyle, our lifestyles that can attract others to find God, find God a lifestyle. They speak of who God is and calls others in. And we are called to <clears throat> live a life of integrity that shines God's truth and honesty in sometimes corrupted situations. So I think our challenge is real in a culture of comfort and consumerism that we won't allow our faith to become one of comfort and consumerism as well, circling more around our needs and our wants or our preferences, if you like, rather than seeking the glory of God. I think that's what we are called to, to live with all of our lives, to, to seek the glory of God which is beautiful. Being transformers. I think that's what I get a feeling about Sardis, that they had fallen into this sense of inoffensiveness. The salt and light was gone from their lives, way of life, even though they might have been busy on the face of it. In verse 4, I think there's a picture of um, a couple of clothes. Um, we learn that most of them had, that we use this expression in here, of soiled their clothes. But Tom Wright describes this as a sort of like a spiritual laziness, like people who can't be bothered to wash their clothes regularly and might then fall into a slack habits in relation to God. A certain apathy about faith and tolerance or participation um, it, with culture, regardless of where God's values are, not seeking his values in our daily lives. And I was, I'm really challenged by this question that I, I read from one of the Simon Gillibald's talks. I think there's a next, if I can have the next picture. Um, comparison between a thermometer and a thermostat. And that's one question that I would like to pose for us, perhaps ponder this week. Am I a thermometer taking the temperature of the culture around me, perhaps observing what's going on around me? Or am I a thermostat that sets the temperature and changing the atmosphere as a result? 
Am I a thermometer taking the temperature of our culture or a thermostat setting the temperature and changing, therefore, the atmosphere? There was an Austrian philosopher, Ivan Illich, who apparently was asked whether it was more effective to change society through violent revolution or a gradual reform. And he replied with this, neither. If you want to change society, you must tell an alternative story. An alternative story. And that, my friends, is what we have. We have a story to tell that changes lives. Infectious story of hope, of grace, forgiveness, life, freedom. Story that can change everything. So we can be confident, I believe there's an encouragement here for us to be confident in what we have in Jesus. And trust that actually many people probably are more interested in engaging with faith than perhaps we give them credit for. I remember a story of a friend. She was praying for a friend of hers. She felt that actually she really wanted to have an opportunity to talk a bit more detail about her faith. And she was looking for opportunities and she was about to have a baby so she knew that time was short. Once the baby came, there would not be time for a long time. So she thought, I've just got to bite the bullet and, and see where it goes. And they sat down and met for a drink and, and she just wanted to raise the issue to, to talk about it. You know, if the friend wanted to talk about faith issues. And her friends, they had a very good conversation and her friend's comment was this. I've been waiting for four years for us to have this conversation. I've been waiting for four years to have this conversation. So that the thought that came to me from that, might there be people you know who are waiting to have that conversation with you? Perhaps just haven't had the courage, or perhaps we haven't been attentive, not in a guilty way, but in, I think I'd like that there be an invitation. You know, pray about it and trust that Lord will give you the courage and the discernment this friend is a Christian today. Her, her husband came to faith some years later and they are thriving and flourishing and serving the Lord. They got to know the good news. Their story changed as a result of that. So let's not rule out that people we know actually want to know more about faith. Jesus died and rose again for us and for everyone, all that we, who, all that we know just as he did for, for you and me. So let's be able to pray this year to start those conversations, seek opportunities, be attentive to those moments with the power of the Holy Spirit who is gentle and sensitive. So it's not about winning arguments or, or fighting our corners or, or bashing anyone down, but also to be bold and countercultural that we have something to share. We have an alternative story being awake for God, living that out, loving people with acts of services, acts of love, as well as our words that make a difference. So starting to draw things together. In verse three, Jesus says, remember what you have received and heard, obey and repent. There's more to it, but to me that summarizes really what, what we've been looking at in here, the urgent call for the church of Sardis to wake up and live out what they know of God, to find that fresh relationship with him again. Not for their own convenience, not out of their own strength, but empowered by the fresh reality of the crucified, risen Lord, who has dealt with everything that holds us back from God, everything that separates us from God, who offers us life through faith in his name, and who does call us to repent and turn away from everything that holds us back in trusting him with our whole lives and keeps us, or what might keep us from being attentive to his voice. Seeing the series of sin in the world and in our own lives and not to be complacent about it. 
and we can ask him to reveal what might cause us to become sleepy because he always receives us when we come to him in repentance, always. We are called for this purity of living and if we stand firm, we will share Christ's victory, be dressed in these white, unsold clothes, receive the eternal life and be acknowledged by name, by our Lord Jesus. So what do we take from this passage? What do we wake up to? We wake up to be active and attentive in our relationship to Jesus. Active, if, it is, if I can have the last, last slide, whether it is being inspired by that excitement of a young child or the sunrise that just brings us to God's presence and, and awakens us to, to be attentive to where he is. Confident in who we are in Christ and his victory. Willing to share his story, live out his story and stay present and look forward to where he's leading us now rather than just looking back. So it'd be good to us to, to take a few moments to um, think about that. You know, where am I today? Or where are we as a church? Are there areas where I might be asleep? Are there areas where we as a church are asleep and are called to wake up and repent? Speak to God about them. And ask Jesus to pour out the spirit of his life on us because he is willing when we come to him. So we take a moment to do that and then the worship team will lead us and we can continue to um, respond through our next song before we move into our prayers. Holy, holy. 
Should we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can be together as your family, that we can meet together, we can worship together, that we know that you will open our hearts, that you will shine your light into us. You'll be the, the sunrise waking us up in the morning. Thank you, Lord, that you have the enthusiasm of a small child. You won't get tired of waiting for us, but you'll keep on calling to us again and again to wake up. Help us to actually do that, Lord. I pray that you would yeah, help us to, to wake up and see what you're doing, to enjoy being with you and live fully alive and awake with you. There's such a lot of stuff going on at the moment, Father, with... Yeah, yeah. the news just seems constantly busy and stressful. A lot of things that crowd out our, our joy, I guess, and make things kind of scary and worrying. I think of all the stuff that's going on in Ukraine at the moment. God, we lift the situation to you now. We lift the leaders of all the different countries to you and the, all of the negotiations and arguments and all that stuff. Father, we trust that you're in control. It's, yeah, the situation's in your hands and we ask, we ask for peace. We ask for peace for the people in Ukraine and, yeah, for your church there. Give them strength, Lord. In other places around the world where there's all kinds of stuff going on, it's for us here in the UK, it feels like COVID is kind of slowly clearing up and more and more things opening. But there's so many places where that's not the case. So many places where vaccination hasn't been possible. Places where COVID is still a massive concern. Places where people are fleeing from wars, all of the people, yeah, after the natural disasters of the last wee while, trying to figure out their lives again after that, on top of everything. Lord, we think about the UK as well, the, all the stuff that's going on with the NHS and things slowly opening up again, but the, yeah, so many doctors and nurses and all of the people working in the NHS being tired and having more, more burdens placed upon them. And I pray you give them strength, Lord, and help them to see and enjoy your peace and your encouragement. I pray that we could be an encouragement and a blessing to them too. And as the restrictions are more and more eased, we pray for people who are immunocompromised and yeah, the, the stress of trying to figure out how life is going to be in the future when it's not as easy and as, as happy as a lot of people think it's going to be changes of cost of living stuff and all that that's going on. There's such a lot of things that cause people to be stressed that are genuine concerns. Lord, it's in your hands and we ask for your will to be done. We also ask that we as the church wouldn't be blind to this stuff. We wouldn't huddle inside our buildings and comfort not be involved. Help us to be awake and get involved and do what needs to be done to help people directly and to, yeah, to, to shout about things that need to be shouted about as well. We lift up the government in the UK and all of the stuff that's going on there, the scandals and issues with infighting and hypocrisy and corruption and just general unhelpful behavior. 
We pray, Father, that people would see that they need you. And they would turn to you, Father, because we know that you are the only source of true righteousness. As we're going into half term for a lot of schools now, we pray for kids to have a really good rest and for teachers to have a really good rest and families to have good time together. For families where it's more stressful, where they don't have enough food or support that they need, we pray that you would provide for them and that the church would reach out and we could be family to them. In our own community here, we lift up the family of Bob Deans and the other people who are ill and sick at the moment and people who have, yeah, families who've lost loved ones recently. I pray that you'd comfort them, Lord, and that you'd use us as well to do that, that we could be your hands and feet could be listening ears, we could be someone to talk to, and yeah, the practical support that people need as well. Father, we pray for ourselves as well. There's so many things where we have become yeah, we each know things where we, we've become comfortable, we've become locked into routines. We're not thinking about what you're saying. We're not thinking about other people. I'm sorry for that, Lord. Holy Spirit, please speak to our hearts. Throughout this whole week, help us to remember again and again and be aware of stuff, to see things with your light, to see things in your perspective, to hear your voice telling us to wake up and actually listen to you and enjoy spending time with you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing us into your family. Should we join together and, and pray using the words Jesus? Gave us as a pattern. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Thank you, Daniel. As we draw our worship to a close, uh, can I just draw your attention to the notice sheet that you will have uh, received, hopefully, as you came in. Quite a few things happening this week. Um, I do just want to start, though, with the very sad announcement, uh, as you would have probably picked up on the e-bulletin and in the notice sheet and through the prayers, that Bob Dean's uh, who was a member of our church family, passed away very suddenly and unexpectedly on Tuesday. Um, Bob was a long-standing member of Cummersdale Church. In fact, um, he did so much to serve that uh, community. Uh, it, so his death uh, has uh, really had quite a profound impact and, uh, on many of us who knew and loved Bob. So can I please ask you to remember Bob's family in your prayers? His funeral is taking place on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, at 3.40 p.m. in Carlisle Crematorium. So 3.40 at Carlisle Crem on Wednesday. Just looking at other things happening this week, um, if you can help clean the toys that we use for our baby gather group uh, in the parish centre on Tuesday, please do have a word with Kate. That's from 10 o'clock onwards. On we uh, Wednesday... Kate's running a big book bonanza. That's down in Cornerstone. That's from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And that's for uh, primarily primary school age children and families. 
and it's tied in with World Book Day, so um, people are invited, if they want, to come dressed up as their favourite book character. Then on Wednesday evening, the ladies have another curry night. Um, I think the ladies are beating the men at the curry nights at the moment. Uh, and it's at 6.30pm, so uh, speak to Sue Stevens if you would like to go. Uh, I think that's probably all in the way of notices. Oh, just to mention that next Sunday, we have just the one service. That will be an all-age service at 10.30am. So 10.30am next Sunday. So as we draw our worship to a close, let's uh, stand and sing one final song. Men of faith, rise up and sing. Please stand. talk I was particularly struck by that illustration and that challenge about are we thermostats uh, or are we um, temperature gauges <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right word then uh, yeah I think that's a real challenge as we go out into this week you know do we as a church of God as, as the people of Christ um, take the temperature of the, the the culture around us or are we setting the culture around us I hope and pray that as we go from here, we are actually thermostats. We are changing the culture. We're changing the atmosphere as we seek to live out our lives and that we heed those words of Jesus to wake up. So let's uh, close with prayer. So Father, thank you that we've been able to come together today. We've been able to worship you. We've been able to study your word and reflect on what it means for us here and now today. We thank you that we've been able to come to you in prayer and bring to you, Lord, the needs of the church, uh, the wider community and the world. And Lord, as we prepare to go from this place, send us out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Equip us, Lord, so that we can live out our lives this week to your praise and to your glory. And Lord, please keep hearing us, uh, enabling us to hear the words of Jesus, calling us to wake up. We do pray, Lord, that you will wake up and revive and renew your church here at St. James, but also around the country, so that we may glorify you and proclaim 
the name of Jesus. So may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us all now and forevermore. Amen.